So this is PE six nine eight G. Lecture fourteen. Fourteen, right? Okay. So uh, we are almost towards concluding our discussion on the delay lock loop. Let me quickly remind you how the circuit looked like. So you have a reference signal. This is passed through a VCDL, and you get your output here. You compare the next edge of the reference with the current edge in the output. What is the first block? A phase frequency detector followed by a charge pump, followed by a loop filter capacitor. And the voltage developed across this loop filter capacitor is used for tuning the delay of the VCDL. Right? Now we saw how we can model it in using a continuous time, small signal, phase domain model. I know so many terms. But now you know the meaning and significance of each of these terms, right? So how did this model look like? You had 5F of S. From this, you would subtract phi out of S. This gives you the phi error of S. And then you multiply this with ICP by 2 pi into 1 pi SC. This gives you VC of S. This passed through KDL in radians per volt gives you some phase. So you add the input small signal phase and this phase to obtain phi out of s and then you can close the loop in the following fashion okay now quickly tell me what is the transfer function from reference to out what is the nature of the transfer function it's an all pass transfer function from pfd to out pfd any noise in the pfd to the output it's a low pass transfer function from VCDL to the out, it's a high pass transfer function. Then we saw the limitation of this model in being able to predict a peaking in the transfer function from reference to the out, right? In By looking at the time domain, we analyzed a little bit and we saw that for uh, reference noise or reference small signal uh, around omega ref by 2 or uh, f ref by 2 you would expect to see the output edges to shift back and forth right and in other words if there was a jitter in the input it is going to get amplified right and we were not able to capture that using the continuous time model now for this reason we are now moving on to the discrete time small signal phase domain model for the DLL. So we individually derived the transfer functions for VCDL and PFT plus charge pump plus loop filter. Now let's put all of them together to obtain the total loop. So you have phi ref of z. From this we subtract phi out of z. And this gives you the error signal phi error of z. Okay, now what do I multiply this with? Please look at the notes from previous class. And so ICP by 2 pi into C. Into C okay. Into 1, minus 1, upon 1, upon 1 upon 1 minus 1 minus Z inverse. Something else? Into D. This gives you Vc of z and then again you pass this through 
KDLR. And you delay this by one cycle. And this gives you phi out of set. Okay. Now you have to calculate the transfer function from reference to the output. So I need phi out of z by phi ref of z. Did you calculate this? Has anyone calculated? If not, feel free to attempt it now. No, no, don't uh, neglect z in this. So one assumption, uh, one simplification you can do is the parameters ICP T ref by 2 pi C into KDLR, you can call this as some alpha so that your calculations will become easy. Did you get one plus alpha upon one plus alpha z inverse? One plus alpha z inverse. Something is missing. This is not correct. Like this. Denominator one plus alpha z inverse. Alpha z inverse. The answer is not completely correct. Can you recheck your calculation? So far okay? So what do you get? Now I can simplify this. This will become alpha z inverse plus z inverse into 1 minus z inverse divided by 1 minus z inverse. This is going to give you 1 minus z inverse plus alpha z inverse divided by 1 minus z inverse. I can uh, ignore the denominator on both sides. So pi out of z by pi ref of z <coughs> will be equal to z inverse into alpha plus 1 minus z inverse divided by 1 minus z inverse into 1 minus alpha. Okay. So I will multiply with z on both numerator and the denominator and I will get 1 plus alpha minus z inverse 
divided by 1 sorry z minus 1 minus alpha this is okay oh good so now let's quickly check for its stability right so what is the pole position now at z is equal to 1 minus alpha now what is the condition for stability right so all the poles should be within within the unit circle right that means the magnitude of 1 minus alpha should be lesser than 1 okay which means the value of 1 minus alpha should be between minus 1 to 1 okay now can you tell me the limits on alpha it has to be lesser than 2 and what is the limit on the other side so the value of alpha has to be between 0 and lesser than 2 so now when you say alpha has to be greater than 0 it means that it has to be a positive number it cannot be a negative number looking at the loop can you quickly tell me what is going wrong if my alpha becomes negative Ah, the feedback becomes positive in nature right so alpha cannot be uh, a negative number now let us see what this alpha lesser than 2 condition is going to yield now do you remember what is the value of alpha what was alpha icp by 2 pi c into t ref no, into kdlr Right. So, this has to be lesser than 2. Is this parameter familiar to you? This was the omega u for your continuous time system. Right. So, let me represent it as omega u that you derive for the continuous time. Right. This has to be this into t ref should be lesser than 2. Right. And this is a condition for stability, which means omega u has to be lesser than. 2 by tref i can replace tref as 1 by tref becomes omega ref by 2 pi <laughs> or in other words this simplifies to omega ref by pi right okay. so now we have a condition for stability for the dll now if you remember we said that we would try and design our dll where omega u was smaller than omega ref by 10. So, once you meet this criteria, it ensures that your continuous time model is accurate enough. On top of that, the stability is automatically taken care of. All right? So, generally you would try and design where omega u is much smaller than omega ref by 10, but in which case continuous time model is sufficient to analyze your circuit. But if you are approaching this limit of omega ref by 10 or the application was such that you had to make your omega u smaller than omega ref, uh, sorry, omega u comparable to omega ref by 10 or uh, even higher, then you have to do both continuous time analysis as well as the discrete time analysis, right? You will have to see the, to capture the complete effect, you will have to look at the discrete time model also. Is that okay? Now let us quickly plot how phi out of z by phi ref of z is going to look like. From continuous time model, what is our expectation? How should this look like? It should be an all pass transfer function, right? So now this is, let me call this as sum h of z, okay? And I am interested in plotting the magnitude of h for the discrete frequency. So I have to do magnitude of h of e power j omega d where omega d is my discrete frequency on x axis you have the discrete frequency now i would plot this from 0 to what is the highest discrete frequency i have to plot this to huh, so pi 
right discrete frequency is from 0 to pi after that it would be alias right right now if your discrete frequency is 0 in continuous time what does that correspond to it corresponds to dc right zero if discrete frequency is pi in continuous time what does that correspond to we are talking about frequency, frequency not trf so you have to tell me an answer in terms of frf everyone is aware of this concept of discrete frequency people who have done dsp remember this some some vague idea yeah. is there? Yes, it should be FRF by 2. It should be FRF by 2, yeah. right? So, if you had a <coughs> continuous time signal, right, then you can talk about a continuous time frequency for it. The moment you sample that signal, you have a discrete time signal, right? So, if FS is your sampling frequency, the uh, maximum frequency, discrete time frequency you will see is FRF by 2, which correspond to pi. Right? So, now our sampling frequency is same as the reference frequency. So, this is FRF by 2. So, this is your continuous time frequency. Like some vague ideas there about this concept? Uh, that much is sufficient for now. For now, just understand that if the discrete frequency is pi, it corresponds to a frequency of FRF by 2. Okay. So, now uh, let us see what the value of magnitude of h of e power j omega d is going to be for these, uh, these two points and then we will simply connect them to get a rough idea of how it is going to be. Right? So, if your omega d is equal to 0, what is the value of z? Right? Z is equal to e power j omega d or e power j 0. Right? This corresponds to 1. Okay? Now, can you substitute the value in magnitude of h of e power j omega d and tell me the value? So, I can directly write it as magnitude of h of z. Simply substitute the value of z equal to 1 in this expression. It is 1? Okay, good. So, this is equal to 1. When your discrete frequency is <coughs> pi, that means your z is e power j pi. What does this correspond to? Minus 1. Right? What is the magnitude? It should not be 1. Okay. So, you are giving me the number as alpha plus 2 by alpha minus 2. Now, what is the range of alpha? It is from 0 to 2. So, have you given me a magnitude or is alpha minus 2 positive or negative? It is going to be negative, right? So, since I asked for magnitude, you should tell me 2 minus alpha. Okay. So, now let us for a non-zero value of alpha because alpha cannot be zero, right? we found that alpha has to be greater than zero. For a non-zero value of alpha, where would, uh, so here the value is at 1, is this value also at 1 or is it greater than 1 or smaller than 1? All that you have to tell me is whether this is, this quantity is greater than 1 or smaller than 1. This is greater than, right? Can it ever become smaller than 1? It can never become smaller than 1, right? This can become equal to 1 only if alpha is 0 or lesser. So, that never happens. Which means your value is something greater than 1 and you will see a transfer function like this, right? So, you can see if it was 1, it was a proper all pass transfer function, it should have been flat, right? Instead, there is a peaking. And how do you think the speaking is going to change as you increase your omega u? So, there is a peaking here, right? If 
ideally if this was an all pass transfer function the transfer function should have been flat yeah. right instead you see that there is a peaking in the transfer function so this is what we call as the jitter peaking yeah. it depends on the value of alpha right so it depends on the value of alpha which in turn depends on the value of omega u at no at omega so this expression if you solve this what do you get here <coughs> so let's assume that z is equal to 1 right so numerator becomes alpha divided by alpha so we have not assumed anything about alpha it just becomes it is equal to 1 irrespective of the value of alpha right so this was alpha by alpha which was equal to 1 now alpha was equal to omega u in the continuous time model into tf yeah. right now as your omega u is increasing is the jitter peaking increasing or reducing increasing. it is increasing right so now if you design for a larger omega u then you have to be clearly aware of the fact that any jitter around f ref by 2 is going to get amplified in your output okay so is there any reason why we would want a larger omega u? So if you wanted the DLL to respond faster, right? Then we want a larger omega u. If you remember the what was the settling time constant for the DLL? Omega. This was equal to huh, one by omega u. Right? The 3dB bandwidth of the DLL or the tracking bandwidth of the DLL was equal to omega u. So higher the bandwidth or the lower the settling time, the DLL is responding faster to any change happening in the loop. Right? So for that reason, you may want to have a larger omega u. But as you make your omega u larger, one, you are becoming more and more sensitive to jitter at the input. It's going to get amplified. Right? And two, <coughs> you might approach the limits of stability. So when your continuous time model may become less and less accurate and then beyond a point it is a, a question of whether the system is stable. Right? So you have to be very careful when you choose the value of omega u. It's a design trade. Now a quick question. Uh, so this was a question that was asked uh, I think two classes prior. So in the DLL we said that the loop is now going to settle very slowly. Right? So if there was a, a fluctuation in fire f that is happening at a faster rate, right? and we want to capture that fluctuation, what do you think we should do? But so even if you, uh, huh, that is one problem. And the other problem is, this is a sampled system. right? Your system is not going to recognize anything more than f ref by 2. Right? If the frequency, huh, so you will have to increase the sampling frequency itself to begin with. Right? So if the frequencies uh, of variation in fire f is much smaller than fire f by 2, then increasing omega u is a choice. But if it is approaching uh, f ref by 2, then increasing f ref itself might be a better solution. Is that okay? Uh, okay, so uh, the alpha is, achha, you are asking uh, why the jitter peaking should increase when alpha value increases? Is that the question? Okay. So the denominator is becoming smaller as alpha is approaching to. Okay, so any questions on the small signal uh, discrete time model? Your question is whether uh, you can plot it with 2pi. So uh, think about it from uh, a Nyquist uh, relation, right? So if it's a sample system, you can, uh, anything above f ref by 2 is going to get alias back, right? So even if you plot from 0 to pi and then to 2pi, right? So let's say you had a relationship something like this. 
right now anything beyond this the system is going to recognize as a frequency between pi and 0 so it will simply be a, a repetition So the DLL we have discussed so far, this is called as a type 1 DLL. <coughs> now it is not necessary that the same signal has to be fed into the VCDL as well as for comparison in the PFT. This can be two different clocks, right? In which case, you would have a DLL architecture as follows. So this architecture is called as a type 2 DLL. So now in type 2 DLL, let us say you have some in signal, both of them are of course clocks going to the VCDL. Now I am going to compare the reference edge using the PFT. So the other signal for comparison is the delayed version of the in. Right? And then this goes through charge pump, a loop filter and then you control the VCDL. Can you tell me what are we trying to achieve here under steady state? Out should be delayed by 2 pi. So I didn't give you the relationship. So in reference, all of these are at the same frequency. Okay. Now there are no comments about the phase relationship between in and reference. In type 1 DLL, that was our aim, right? So, I am giving you a different uh, delay locking architecture, right? So, uh, so, what will happen is if I look at the output edge, that should match the reference edge, right? So, if this, if I represent my ref with red color, then this should exactly match with the reference edge. What comments can you make about the delay of the VCDL? Will it be TREF? No. Need not be. Yeah. It can be yeah. also, yeah. right? Yeah. It could be anything between 0 to TREF, right? Will it be equal to the phase it will be in and there? Could be. It could be that plus a TREF also. Uh -huh. and yeah. uh, right? It can be any delay required such that the out and the reference edges are matching. Basically, the phase error seen here should be equal to 0, that is all. So now can you quickly do the small signal model for this and find out the transfer function from input to the output and reference to the output. Yes. If you increase the order of the loop filter, can we? Ah, you can alter the transfer function, yes. So you will be able to alter the transfer function, you will be able to suppress the jitter peaking also. What do you think will happen if I increase the order of the loop filter? This part is correct, but uh, any other comments on stability? System can become slow, but now you have two poles, right? So the system can also ring a lot, the phase margin can reduce considerably. So then it uh, yeah, that depends, it is a again a design trade off, right? So, you will have to design such that you have sufficient phase margin for the DLL. Feel free to discuss. So, let us quickly sketch the small signal model. So you have some phi in of s. <coughs> mm. 
going through the BCDL. Here you have <coughs> fire of of s. Now fire of of s, you have to subtract phi out of s. This gives you the phi error of s. Multiply this by ICP by 2 pi into 1 by SC. This gives you the BC of S. And you multiply this with KDL R. Okay. So this is now your phi out of S. And the loop then closes like this. Okay. Can you quickly tell me the loop transfer function? Yeah. So to calculate the loop transfer function, you have to make both phi ref of s and phi in of s to zero. You have to de-energize both the sources, break the loop somewhere here, inject a test voltage, and see how much is returning to the same point. So the calculation is very similar to the calculation we did for type 1 DLL. And this is ICP KDLR by 2 pi C okay, into 1 by S. Okay. And what is omega U? So that will be equal to ICP into KDLR by 2 pi c. How do you calculate omega u? You calculate what is L of j omega's magnitude at omega equal to omega u and equate it to 1. Right? And then you can find out what is the value of omega u. <coughs> okay. So what expression did you get for phi out of s by phi ref of s? I'll solve this. So now I have two sources in the system. There is a phi in of s and phi ref of s. I am interested in the transfer function from phi ref to phi out. What should I do to phi in? Yeah. It has to be de-energized. In other words, I have to make this to zero. Right. Now let me replace this whole thing as omega u by s. So now if I calculate, so it is phi ref of s minus phi out of s into it is direct standard form. This is equal to phi out of s. Right? In other words, you get phi out of s by <coughs> phi ref of s. What do you get? 1 by 1 plus s by omega u. This is a low pass transfer function with respect to omega. I am plotting phi out by phi ref, the log of this value, it will look like this. What is this frequency? Omega. Omega. Similarly, can you tell me what is phi out by phi in? So this will come out to be? s upon s plus omega u. So let me write it in the standard form s by omega u by 1 plus s by omega u. And is it similar? Right, but is phi ref the transfer function from phi ref to phi out same as before? 
Is it? No, in type one DLS. Comparing the noise and we injected the at the PFT. So it's similar to if you are comparing the noise injected at the PFT, it is same. But if you were looking at the noise included in the reference. Right, from small signal reference to output in type one, it was an all pass transfer function, but now it is a low pass transfer function. That is a major difference. So this is now a high pass transfer function. Any confusion in calculation of this? This is very straightforward, right? So this is with respect to omega, and you will have omega u. What is omega u called here? Omega u is the 3 dB bandwidth. Okay, so we have we now know how to analyze a DLL. We have seen two different delay lock loops. Our main aim in starting to learn about the DLL was such that we could implement a TDC. Right? So now we know how to implement a DLL. Can you implement a TDC for me? <laughs> TDC is a time to digital converter. This was like in the first three classes. <laughs> okay, so let's say I want a TDC with resolution equal to 200 picosecond. Let's say I have a reference clock with period. So let's say T ref equal to 2 nanosecond. Right. Do you remember the implementation of a flash TDC? Yes. Right. So a flash TDC, we were interested in measuring the delay between a stop signal and a start signal. Now to do this, we introduced buffers in the stop path and then compared the state of the stop and the buffered start at different stages. So this was O1 and then we would repeat the same. This was O2 etc. Right? And the problem we faced was while it was possible to realize a delay of 200 picosecond, it was hard to realize 200 picosecond across PVT. Right? And then we learned we can achieve this using a DLL. So how do I put all that information together and construct a TDC? The DCDL is the start module. So you are saying that this signal now should be part of my DLL, this chain and I use yeah. a PFD like yeah. this and charge pump and the loop filter and then try and control the delay. Yeah. Does everyone agree with this? Anybody sees a problem with this implementation? So the start signal is a one-time signal, it is not a clock. Right? Your start and stop were signals like this. Right? So now, but in if this is a delay lock loop, which means I need to feed a reference through the VCDL chain so that I can continuously keep the lock active. Right? So now what do you think we should do? We, a reference clock is given. So, would you feed the reference clock somewhere or? So, why don't you take a minute to discuss and see how to implement this? <laughs> Matching should be. So, what I'm going to do is. I construct another DLL. I construct a DLL with delay elements like this. So these are of course tunable delay elements. Then I have PFT, the following charge pump, the capacitor. Let's say this voltage is some VC1. Now I feed this VC1 to all these elements. Right? Now I make sure 
so uh, if i wanted a delay of 200 picosecond where this reference clock was at 1 nanosecond sorry 2 nanosecond period how many elements should i have you should have 10 elements okay so you'll have elements varying from 1 to 10 now i make sure that these buffers are identical to the ones in the delay line and i feed the same vc1 voltage from here right now if these buffers are exactly matched then they will also have the same delay as the loop so now if your temperature changes and your buffer delay is going to vary the loop is going to vary the vc1 such that the buffer delay comes back to 200 picosecond since this buffer is identical to this buffer that will also have 200 picosecond as the delay now when i say matching it has to be exactly matched for example if this buffer is seeing the clock input of a uh, df of a flip flop you need to add the same load here as well so you can put a dummy flop or dummy for the uh, stages seen by this node such that the capacitance at this node is identical and when you lay them out the layout also needs to be identical is this okay any questions on the flash tds implementation okay sure for the lnl and your flash tds are different so you need to place them as close to each other as possible so when you lay so this is a rough schematic but when you lay them out whatever is the distance between them you would ensure that the same layout is used here also you would lay out this once and simply replicate it instantiate it twice right when you are doing the layout and you will place them as close to each other as possible. So uh, the other part is the number of delay units here in the TDC need not be same as the number of delay units used in the reference, right? So the number of delay units here is going to be determined by the maximum delay you want to measure. Okay. So in the constraints, we have given a resolution. We have also given two nanosecond as a reference clock, there would also be a maximum time interval that you will need to measure. Let's say this was equal to 4 nanosecond. Okay. Then how many such stages do you have to cascade? So if this was one stage, which was giving you O1, you will need to go till O20 to be able to measure a T max of 4 nanosecond. Okay. So the number of stages in the uh, in this TDC implementation is determined by the constraint on the maximum time interval to be measured. But the number of buffers in the VCDL is going to be determined by the resolution you require. So now given all of this, now it is up to you to uh, lay them out such that uh, they see similar environments. So you make sure a particular uh, buffer sees similar environment in terms of loading. So the loading is something you can mostly take care of in the schematic and then when you are doing routing it has to be identical so that any parasitics that come due to layout routing also become identical and then you put them as close together as possible. Is that okay? <coughs> now when I say making layout identical it always involves adding dummies around. For example if you had one transistor here, right? And for some reason, it was seeing a metal line on this side. Mm -hmm. And you wanted to match this to another transistor. Even if it is not required, you have to put a metal line here as a dummy. <laughs> that is how you make layouts identical. So if this was seeing another transistor here, which was uh, processing some signal, even if it is not required here, you put a similar transistor here as well, just to make the layout identical. Right? Okay. So a simple flash TDC implementation is of course very easy to achieve. Uh, what if the resolution I wanted is equal to let's say 25, no, let's say 50 picosecond, right? But let's say the minimum buffer delay in the technology you are working with is greater than 50 picosecond. Let's say this is somewhere around 150 picosecond. We take that 
as to what we should call that did you understand in the assignment i had given a problem where there were buffers in both the start and the stop part right and the resolution was then the difference in the delay of both the buffers what should we call such a tdc difference <laughs> what does this idea remind you of where you have two measurement and then you are taking the two quantities and your resolution is a difference in the two quantities not differential right relative but another term vernier right do you remember vernier measurements you probably did something in your first year related to vernier measurements online online class okay so this tdc is called as a vernier tdc right so the idea is very simple you have the stop path and you have a start path right you add buffers in both the paths and then you compare the output this is your o1 and you repeat the same stage again O2. <coughs> Now let's say the delay in the start was t2. What should be the delay here? Should this be t2 or t1, t3? This is also t2. Let's say this is t1. In which case, what is the resolution? This is t2 minus t1. t2 has to be greater than t1. How would I achieve t2 and t1? you use dlls right so let's say i used dll1 to achieve t1 right now i the only constraint is t2 minus t1 has to be equal to so the resolution now we are working with is 50 picosecond right if i use dll1 for achieving t1 then it is going to be some t ref by let's say k1 for t1 similarly i am using another dll to achieve this t2 so this is going to be tref by k2 and the difference between them should be equal to 50 picosecond where k1 and k2 has to be integers right so one uh, possible solution is maybe i can use 250 picosecond here and 200 picosecond here is that okay so if tref is 2 nanosecond what are the values for k1 and k2 k2 is 8 and k1 is 10 okay so this is a possible design choice so you will have dll1 which is giving you t1 and this has 10 vcdus in the delay chain and then you have dll2 this is giving you t2 and this needs to have 8 vcdus in the chain okay and then you simply have to match the uh, vcd vcdus in dll2 to the vcdus you see here and vcdus in dll1 has to be matched to this and you have a vernier tdc implementation now here is a question in this implementation you are going to use two dlls right which means two pfds two charge pumps two capacitors etc and the capacitor values are not going to be very small it's going to be in the order of few picofarads right which means it's going to take up a lot of area could you have achieved this with a single loop is the question clear no. Question is not clear. Sometimes we are taking two with DLL loop. Correct. We need one loop. I am not even no, calling it DLL. Ha. Could you have achieved this resolution of T two minus T one using a single loop? <coughs> But you want two PFDs, is it? 
but you have two delay lines also right are you going to tune both the delay lines the reason why i ask that is if you are going to tune both the delay lines which means you need to have two capacitors they might need two separate voltages so that is a clue you will have to tune only one delay line and achieve this feel free to discuss We need two voltages if I am planning to tune both the delay lines. Can I achieve the same T two minus T one resolution by tuning only one delay line? If we have ten small elements, you can take the output after the eight elements to get that much delay. Is that correct? So if you have ten small elements, right? Then the delay is T ref by ten. Now, if you tap it after eighth element, the delay you get is eight by ten t. So this is Vernier TDC implementation two. Correct. We can directly generate that. We can directly generate it, but how would I generate it? It has to be stable across PVT, which means some sort of loop has to be there to continuously track it. Right? But going in the right direction, we have to generate T2 minus T1 by controlling only one loop. <coughs> Let me show you one way in which this can be done. So I take my reference. I pass it through. Two chains. Right? And then I use a PFT to compare this. So PFT plus charge pump plus the loop filter. This is going to generate a VC voltage. And let's say I come back and tune only one of the delay lines. Okay. So let's assume that the delay in the uh, first buffer is T1. I'm not claiming that it is stable. It is some T1, T1. right? Let's say this is equal to some T2. Yeah. And I use n elements here. And I use the same number of elements. <coughs> in the second chain also okay so now let's say my reference signal is like this okay my t1 sorry uh, this is my out one this is my out two so the pft is trying to make sure the delay between out one and out two is zero so let me plot my out one. What would be the delay between an edge and reference and out one? So this is going to appear after a delay of n times t1. Right? Now out two, what would be the delay? So that will be equal to n t2. So now let me roughly sketch some n t2 here. So this delay is some n times t2. Mm -hmm. Now if the DLL is locking, right, we can make sure that the first edge of the out, let's say this is first and second edge, this is the first and second edge of the out2. I can make sure that the first edge in out2 is locking to the second edge in out1. This is something we can do, right? This is similar to what we did in our type 1 DLL also. We made the PFD ignore the first edge here. Mm -hmm. That's all. Now, once I do this, can you tell me the uh, delay from here to here? So my n, th this will be equal to n t1 plus t ref, mm -hmm. and this is equal to n t2. Right? The delay of the second chain 
is now equal to whatever was the delay uh, from there to out one plus one clock period. Okay, so now it's a matter of rearranging this equation. So I have, yeah. So now this gives us n t two minus n t one equal to t r f. In other words, t two minus t one equal to t r f by n. So simple, right? Any questions on this? <coughs> so once you have so t two minus t one is t f by n, right? So now you need to uh, your t one is here. You make sure this t one, this buffer is identical to this buffer. <laughs> Right. Similarly, these tunable buffers have to be identical to the buffers in the start path. Right. I can't guarantee anything about the individual value of t two or t one, but at all times, t two minus t one is t clock by. <coughs> this is okay. Okay. Yeah, like how was t one set? T1 is some delay of the initial buffer chain. It's not tunable. It's something fixed, right? So you design for it. Uh, it will have some characteristic varying with PVT, right? But it's not tunable. And why? Why we are sure that uh, T reference by capital M hmm? equals to T2 minus T2 minus T1. Huh. So uh, this difference being equal to T1 uh, N T1 is clear. Right. So the delay from here to the first edge of the out two has to be n t two. Is that also clear? Okay. So now under steady state conditions, let's say I'm observing the waveform under steady state conditions. Then you will see that the edges of out one and out two are exactly matched. Right. Just that if the edge number here is one. It is going to match to what is the edge number here? To edge number zero, right? The if one is going to appear here, right? So the delay, so the delay from here to here is equal to n t two, right? If I inject. So if I inject the first ref zeroth, sorry, first reference edge here, that is going to appear here at some instant n t one. The first reference edge is going to appear here at after a time instant n t two. Right. So if I subtract n t one from n t two, that has to be one clock period. Is that okay? Next up. So instead of having two loops with two PFTs, two charge pumps, and two capacitors, you can get away with a single feedback loop. <coughs> so now let me show you another application for the DLL. This is for deskewing the clock. Okay. Let's say you have a digital circuit. Some big digital logic is running. You know that you will be feeding a clock signal to this. You will also be feeding multiple data inputs to this, right? Let's say from D1, D2, etc., till Dn, right? So multiple data inputs are going to be fed to this, and you would expect to see a fixed phase relationship between the clock and the data. So if this is your clock signal. You would expect your data to change either at the rising edges of the clock, or it could change at the falling edges of the clock. And this phase relationship needs to be well known. Why? So the time from which the clock is changing to when the data is changing and becoming stable, as well as you know falling edge transition to when the clock is getting the data is stable. 
why do we need this face relationship to be well known? Because we need to check for setup and hold analysis within the block, right? So the input data and clock relationship must be well known. Now the thing is, this clock is going to go to multiple uh, nodes within the block, to multiple flops, which means the capacitance seen by this clock is going to be very large. So much like how you learned in 619, you will have to put some buffer chain to be able to drive this clock properly. The moment you insert a buffer chain, this is going to have some delayed TD. And more interestingly, this TD will be a function of process voltage and temperature. Right? So what this means is now this clock is going to shift, it's going to be delayed by some amount and we are not sure what that amount is. Which means the phase relationship between the clock and the data are now not well known. Right? Is it possible to make TD equal to 0? No. No, right? Then what is the next best solution? Make it a constant zero. Make it a constant, right? Yeah. So make it a constant, but more importantly, yeah. if I make it T rest, right? So if I add a variable delay element here and I tune it such that this total delay becomes equal to one clock period, right? Then it doesn't make any difference for the digital module. Whether this is my first edge or whether you know, this is my zeroth edge or second edge, the digital block doesn't care. It only requires a constant relationship between clock and data. So to do this, we can, uh, so now how would you de -skew it? Ha. So you can have the clock coming in through a VCDL and then <coughs> you can have a chain of buffers and then this is your clock input to the digital module and I'll come to that and then I will lock the whole thing using PFD plus the charge pump plus the loop filter. Right, and then this controls it. Okay, so this is one possible solution. Now the question I got is, why can't I absorb these buffers into the VCDL itself? Any, uh, is that a possible solution? <coughs> it is a possible solution, right? What are the drawbacks with that solution? Or what is, what do you have to keep in mind if you are combining both? So you are saying the buffers together, I call this as a VCDL. No, I mean, uh, whatever, uh, whatever variable elements you need, huh. that will reflect the effect you want is just a two TRF. Uh, just a TRF delay. Yeah, just a TRF delay. TRF or multiples of TRF, whichever is so easier. So if you have some kind of fixed delay that is being uh, given by those buffers, mm -hmm. then the amount of variability the amount of variability you need is lesser, right? But is there anything else that is more critical? Uh, symmetrical part is not a concern now, right? You are not worried about clock faces from the delay lock. lock. You just need these clock input to get aligned, right? You are not worried about individual clock faces from this, right? So the you, you have designed these buffers with the uh, keeping in mind that you need to drive a large load right so now if you combine both the requirements you will have to uh, upsize your vcdl elements as well yeah. right so instead if you split it this vcdl can have minimum power and its only intention is to simply provide a tunability in the delay whereas you can have the uh, buffer chain here such that enough drive strength is available to drive a large capacitance so there are two requirements coming into play here. One is the total delay has to be TREF. The other requirement is this buffer should be able to provide sufficient current such that it is able to give a reasonable uh, rise time and fall time across this very large capacitance. If it's possible, you can combine them. But in most cases, it's usually easier to separate it. 
So you design VCDL only for tunability and you have the buffer only for driving it. And then together you make sure that the delay becomes TF. In this case, VCDL will have delay, will have delay. It needs to have delay less than TRF. Now, if it has delay more than TRF, let's say you designed it and you found that the delay is more than TRF, then you simply make sure that it locks to 2 TRF. Makes no difference to the digital circuit. So harmonic locking is not an issue in an application like this. <coughs> okay. So now uh, one quick question. So far, when we use the DLL, all the frequencies in the system have been the same. Is it possible to get a multiplied frequency as an output? Is there any way you can manipulate the circuit to multiply the frequency? Is there anything you can add to the loop or? So if I look at any DLL architecture, right? If the clock was at some frequency FRF, my output clock also has the same frequency, right? Let's say instead of FRF, I wanted two times FRF, somehow. If you put a D flop, you can get FRF by two. You can, division is easy. Let's say I want to multiply. <coughs> that is one possible solution. But given that you have a DLS and you have a delay line with clock faces easily available, is there something else you can think of? Put another delay element and then? Okay, so some sort of uh, logic is needed to control a mux, is it? When I put a constant, uh, like depend on the frequency, put a constant delay and then put an extra constraint. Put a constant delay and put an extra, right? Remember so what the should the be the constant? Extra input to the clock and the clock in. So you are saying, let's say this was my clock. Move from the XR, some of the digital clock. Huh. So if this was my clock, my clock in is also going to look identical to this under steady state. Huh. Not that way. Let's say I put a uh, not T rest, huh. put another, another T rest, T rest by so on. So let's say uh, I take a delay line with four elements. Right, and let's say I lock this to TRF, right? Which means this will have a delay of TRF by four, right? So in terms of phase, this is 90 degree phase shifted, this is 180 degree phase shifted, this is 270, and this is 360, which means a full cycle is over, right? So let me call this as, let's say this is my N1, and this is some V1, right? I'll quickly finish this. So if my N1, looked like this, my V1 is going to be delayed like this, right? Now if I do an XOR of both of these, my signal is going to look like this. So I have doubled the frequency. Okay. So there are Is other there ways. Multiply frequency in the uh, so if you are multiplying frequency like this, how do you ensure that it is 90 degree phase shifted? <laughs> no, no. So now you know if you have a DLM, mm. you can ensure that it is 90 degree phase shifted and then multiply. And in the, in the normal, in the design of circuits, uh -huh. the frequency multiplier is like This is one way to achieve frequency multiplication uh -huh. for, uh, there is something called as a multiplying DLL, right? So multiplying DLL is not part of the mid-semester. Uh, so if anybody wants, because the class time is over, if anybody wants to leave, they can leave. But I'll continue with the explanation for multiplying DLL, right? So what you do is, if you had, 
odd number of inverters and you connect it like this, this is going to oscillate. Yeah. Right? So now imagine you take a VCDL with odd number of inverters. Okay. okay? And you have a provision to either <laughs> feed the reference directly or you can feed the output of the VCDL back into the VCDL. Okay. What is this is a mux. <laughs> right. So the mux is going to select either the reference or the output of the VCDL. Right. So which means when the uh, mux is selecting the output of the VCDL back into the VCDL, this is acting like a ring oscillator. Right. Everybody is familiar with a ring oscillator. Good. So this is acting like a ring oscillator. Otherwise, it is simply acting as a VCDL, a delay chain. So now I take this and I compare it with the reference. So let's say I have this PFT plus charge pump plus the loop filter and then I connect this to VCDL. Just that this PFT is also active at VCDL, certain instances. Inverter, so one VCDU is an inverter and you have odd number of inverters. Here. Okay. Then, the then the delay is? We have even numbers of the so, another way to think about it is, <coughs> so if you have even number, then you are comparing the rising edge to rising edge. Yeah. If you have odd numbers, you will have to look at the delay from rising edge at the input to the falling edge uh, at the output. Or there are other ways to do this also, but for now, imagine you are comparing uh, rising edge to falling edge. Right, and then you can have some selection logic here. Now the PFD is also going to uh, check the selection, uh, compare this at certain instances. Okay, so I'll tell you the very crude idea. Let's say this was your reference. Right, now you make sure let's say once the reference is injected into the VCDL, right, you allow it to go around twice. After that, you compare the output. Is that okay? You allow the reference to circulate like this once and once more and then only you compare the outputs here. Right? So in that case, you are allowing the signal to go around twice, right? So you will have a relationship similar to this. This is a crude idea, of course, the selection logic is slightly more complicated. Mm. How you feed back the signal is also a little bit more complicated. But this is a rough idea for a multiplying DLL, where you make your VCDL <coughs> act like a ring once in a while. Now, if you wanted to get further multiplication, then you go for a phase lock loop. That is a different timing loop altogether. Okay, thank you.